Hello, my name is Nancy Cool. I'm the curator of poetry for the Yale Collection of American Literature at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University. I'm delighted to welcome viewers from Yale's poetry community near and far to the 2021 Yale College Poets Reading. This annual event is co-sponsored by the Beinecke Library and the Creative Writing Program of the Department of English. Many thanks to all the collaborators who work to organize this program. With intelligence and vitality, the 12 excellent young poets whose work you are about to hear remind us of all that poetry offers us in a complicated and challenging time. Reflection, beauty, resilience, power. It's my pleasure to introduce Haley Andrews, Emma Brody, Gabrielle Colangelo, Pat Korfman, Anastasia Delianis, Kiran Demoderin, Uma Duveda, Ananya Kumar Banerjee, Lucy Silba, Eliana Sverdlo, Irena Vasquez, and Sophia Zhao. Hi, my name is Haley Andrews, and I'm a junior studying English from Southern California, and I'm in Pearson College. Today I have two short poems I will be reading. Uh, before I start, I want to extend my appreciation to Professor Zarin for her attention and support in assembling these poems. The first poem is titled Butcher's Daughter, and it begins with an epigraph from Virginia Woolf's Orlando. Nature, who has played so many queer tricks upon us, making us so unequally out of clay and diamonds, of rainbow and granite, and stuff them into a case, often of the most incongruous, for the poet has the butcher's face and the butcher of poets. The first day of work, you plunged a knife into your thigh. This was accidental, you said, a case of mistaken identity. The blood clotted like sap, slowed by the cold of the meat freezer. Reckless and dizzy, you applied super glue to the parted edges as you finished out your shift. 17 and stealing cars and shit, according to mom. Stubborn and scared body without sleep, speed free. There was never any chance for the knife to miss, skin puckered and eager for edge. The smell of stale blood followed you home, but there was always a parcel in hand, neat from work, packaged like a gift. And I would say I could never do that. The second poem I'll be reading is a sonnet titled For Joe. Who am I to you today? In your eyes, I see traces of origin, Kansas plains and a dust bowl reflex that relies on movement to live. This disease forces you forward now, stumbling into the dark. First, it was an extra pile of towels, a name on the tip of your tongue. Then the roaming and searching, like a dove dispatched for dry earth, occasionally to return. Somehow you are both stranded in the wine dark and searching relying on motion to survive. Once you landed, you lost your glint, your face an avalanche of features. No more waiting for branches. Thank you. Hello, my name is Emma Brody and I'm a senior in Sullivan College. I am going to read two poems to you today. The first one is called, The World is Full of Men Named Gary. The world is full of men named Gary. On the day I was born, my father began by going to the cell of a man who'd killed his girlfriend, strangled her and left her in the fridge, fingers white. The voices said something. What did they say? They were angry. Who were they angry with? Two people in a cold gray room without a carpet. Coffee, Coke, I am your friend, Gary. My mother felt gravity shift in her stomach, knew. Another man hid the soft body inside a bush. Why the bush? Dunno. Flashlights in the trees. Does this hurt? This? Do you ever feel like other people don't understand you? My father analyzed his own dreams. Big-eyed dolls eating things they shouldn't. Mother screaming prayers to a god that wasn't his. I am your friend, Benjamin. My father's afraid, so he cries now when he answers the phone. Leaves the men in their cells for the day. Drives. Hours later, in a small white room, something small and flustered unplugs from my mother's flesh. We scream a bit. Our noses are red from the effort. My father is there and is not. He takes an inventory, fingers and toes, fingers and toes, imagines a quivering body, 
formed out of everyone's loose bits of living. Kisses the top of my head, blinks, and tries to remember which muscles he uses to smile. The next day, he meets another man named Gary. This one used a penknife. And my second poem is very different. Um, it is called Monday Morning Early. Monday Morning Early. I love you like I love a silent K. The way it sits at the edge of a word and changes not its sound, but its ness. Its knees that buckle and fold and straighten and stretch, her toes curling round your calves. I love you. I love you the way sweaters love moths who flutter soft into their threaded soles and bless what their fingers take away. Tremble. I love you the way the highway loves the coming of a summer rain. I love you more than the state of Illinois, which I have never loved, more than ink blots and apostrophes. I love you the way my stomach says to love you. It is hot and insistent and begs you, please, please don't fall asleep. I love you the way flowers love dew, the way dew loves sunshine, and the way sunshine loves nothing but itself. I love am not you. I love am nots of you, of not, of knuckles shut and opening and caught. I love you like a tumor loves its flesh. Not unto death, dear, unto a cavity of wholeness. Thank you. Hello. My name is Gabrielle Colangelo, and I'm a senior in Brantford College. Thank you so much for having me. This first poem takes its title from a painting by Joseph Wright of Darby. A philosopher lecturing on the orrery. Last night I dreamed I was back in the study. I saw the green curtains, my sister's arm draped around my brother's neck, mama with her hat like a table, I was in my fanciest dress again. It itched. The great metal world stayed cold against the heat of the light. I pushed my elbows against the iron frame and focused on the tiny painted moons. When I'm still, I can see it. That place we were the first time the lamp took the place of the sun. Before I read this next poem, I would just like to thank Professor Louise Gleck for her guidance and mentorship. Inventory. I confess I am cruel, selfish, ugly, 12. I give up food for Lent, but eat when hungry. I use holy water to slick my eyebrows back. I skip stations of the cross two through 13, am condemned to death, laid in my tomb. I have braces, bad skin. Meanwhile, I am 20 and obsessed with other people's marriages. I do not believe in God and want bad things to happen to people. I watch my reflection in every window. I think only of bodies. I worry I'll be alone because sex will always be complicated. It's too much to ask of someone. You said this today. Is it too much to ask of me? No, but you don't want me. It is beautiful how you sit lean forward and pull your hair into a bun so swiftly that your glasses get caught up in it and are crooked as you eat your toast. I wonder, will I reveal myself eventually to be weak enough to love you still? Once a taxi driver told me he'd read the Bible 30 times in the past two years, once a month plus more during Lent. He said it eventually answer every possible question. It seemed like a lot to ask of a book. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Kat Korfman and I'm a senior in Jonathan Edwards College. I'm grateful to be here and to all the professors and mentors and fellow student poets who continue to help shape my thinking and my writing. Um, both of these poems will be part of my tutorial and writing project this semester, a semi-autobiographical collection uh, centered on the theme of home. Um, I know home means a lot of different things to me as it does for many people but the poems I'll read today are closely tied to my home in rural Alabama. Writing desk. One warm winter afternoon, I bought a sewing desk like my great grandmother's, the one rooted into the carpet of her dead grandchild's childhood room. 
the one with its drawers full of candlesticks. The man at the antique shop slid it top down across the bench back seat of my grandmother's grand marquee, and I drove home all the way a grin brimming with the bright pull of possibility. In my mind's eye was not the big sky or the gray winding of county roads, but the milky color of jade, the glint of brass. A lick of the upper lip, anticipation of the taste of my own sawdust coated sweat as butch as I'll ever get. Inside, just enough space for the necessities. Notepads, paper clips, Rich and Bishop, flask of, flask of gin, black gel pens in neat rows ready for the march, never mind the wobble. On a hairpin turn, I reach back to grip its ankles sticking up at the low fabric ceiling. I'm telling myself already to keep everything in its place where it all belongs, out of sight. Candlesticks in the candlestick drawer, notebooks in the notebook drawer, words in the gin drawer, or is it gin in the words drawer? And in the middle hinged one with the little bee knob, silly little glitter pins that I fear may dry up before I'm brave enough to use them, that worse may never dry up but explode when the drawer gets so sick of shutting up that it bursts open and leaves me with nothing but the ink stained hands that tried to seal it. Electric fences. Nine again, I help my friend and her brother skin a doe. Pink, the tongue hanging out, almost silly. Our fat winter coats with zipper pools like raindrops. I don't remember the knife across the white throat or the red mouth it leaves or whether the body is strung up by its hind legs or fore. The eyes, cartoon eyes crossed out. The tailgate open like a drooling jaw naked black trees, a sun sleeping in again. On three, we pull hard and it tears down the skin like wallpaper. What it looks like underneath is a red blank. The knife makes tenderloins of her, which we carry like sleeping eels and lay to rest on the ridges of the truck bed. My friend is tangled blonde and laughing. Raw meat, when still hot, belongs somewhere in the unnamed space between flesh and food. I don't remember being asked to do this, but I can see my hands outstretched against a sky that resists dimension, weary and gray with the threat of sleep. After this, we will sit on the backs of half-tamed animals, free of leather and buckles and fear of the half-frozen ground. We will braid brown pine needles into their manes and each other's. The young doe's sacrifice will feed us for months. As long as I am dreaming, no one will make us come inside. Hi, my name is Anastasia Dalianis. I'm a senior majoring in humanities and I'll be reading two poems. The first is called Seven Ways of Looking at Bees. One. A slow afternoon, just the girl and the bees. The bees are always there. It is easier for her to pretend that they are not. Two, a bee always hides another bee. This is a well-known fact. Push one bee to the side and another takes its place. Three, the archeologists found 300 golden bees in the dead king's tomb. They had kept him company for 1200 years, a shroud of honey and garnet over bone. Four, the bee is a feathery weight in the girl's hand. It is softer than she expected it to be. Five, it is also dead. She places it on her chest that night when she goes to sleep. The other bees watching from outside the window think that the girl's heartbeat might remind the bee what it is like to be alive. Bees do not have heartbeats. The bee on the girl's chest does not understand the message. Six, there are more bees than sky today. Seven, it is difficult to tell where the bees end and the sky begins. The second poem is called The Lady and the Roses. What you have heard is true. I was there last year as summer crept into early autumn. I had learned about the village from a middle-aged man at a visitor center 50 kilometers away at the base of the mountains. I am not sure what led me to interpret his warning 
that I should only stay there if I had to as an instruction to stay there. Nevertheless, I did not plan an alternative route and by nightfall, it became clear to me that I would have no choice. I stood in the town square in front of a small fountain and let the emptiness settle on my skin, soft and thick as sleep. The roses were blooming. I did not find this strange, even though the blossoms were enormous, syrupy red, and releasing a scent that made me feel both intoxicated and desperately ill. It must have been after midnight when I awoke and saw her, kneeling in the rose bushes across from where I lay on the cobblestones. In the moonlight, she resembled a porcelain doll that had been dragged through a gutter. She wore a black gown with a dirt-smeared white collar, and her knuckle bones gleamed like pearls through pale skin. She was pressing something to her mouth, and as I watched, hardly daring to breathe, a line of blood trickled from the corner of her bottom lip and left a bead-shaped stain on the collar of her dress. The last thing I wanted was to look into her eyes, but she did not give me a choice. She held me in her gaze as tightly as the rabbit she had just discarded, limp and drained of life. I could hear the blood rushing through my ears and neck, through the spot where she could kiss me and so easily bind my death to hers. Instead, she produced another feebly twitching rabbit from beneath the rose bush and cupped it tenderly in her palm for a moment before bringing it to her lips. I will never understand why she chose to spare me that night. I can feel it sometimes, her mouth on my neck, teeth cut like diamonds beneath a velvet sky. She could have made herself so much less lonely. I wonder if she knows this too. Hi, my name is Kieran Demoderin and I am a senior in Pauli Murray College. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share some of my work and I'm very grateful to have had the mentorship and guidance of many wonderful professors and friends, especially my advisor, Claudia Rankin, in creating and shaping these pieces. I will be reading two poems. The first is called Preverbal. Lamplight melds our silhouettes on the wall. Your hands plucking bones from my rib cage. Mine studying your tongue. I taste the rust gathered on your lips. Here we are still hungry watching darkness suck the stars dry. I siphon light from the dwindling. Open your mouth and I will feed you. I am man of lotus, god of shame, brother of guilt. The second poem I will be reading today flowered out of an erasure exercise I did with a Reddit post in the r slash conspiracy thread. Uh, and the title is Extremely Strange Experience in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. I'm a religious man until around 11 p.m. when I venture into bliss with a 44 Magnum, a sizzling blackout, and a piece of jerky. I have a strange instinctual feeling I cannot explain for the life of me a hunger for experimentation. I swallow myself, digesting until my mind is filled with what ifs. I think maybe I am hallucinating or sleepwalking until I feel the fingers, your hand, grab me as I disappear into unknown territory. Even in the extreme dark I feel my body spinning, a static charge building in the stars in the moon, rationalizing against my resisting mind by killing it in thin air, leaving it in another dimension. No visible residue, just a strong lingering smell. I have taken four steps forward I've stumbled into the sun setting east of familiar cloud cover. I have a severe feeling of love and uneasiness. I have stepped out of a tunnel into light. I am droplets on a skillet. I am the sun no longer hidden. Upon returning home, I immediately tell my wife. She is just as perplexed as I am. Anyone else experience love like this? Thank you for listening.
Hi, my name is Uma Dilili and I'm a junior in Davenport studying sociology. Today, I'm gonna to read two poems from a collection I'm working on. Thank you for being here. Harmony in Blue and Pearl. On the heavy table, you splay open chord diagrams, minor, diminished, because you wanna know how this works. You always have the radio gutted on the kitchen floor as your mother sang on. You, screwdriver in hand, silence scraping your tongue until it bled. You wanted her song uncorrupted, so harmony became a brutal affair. The pearl in your throat bearing your name would break your jaw if you tried to spit it out. For years, you have swallowed it down. We have been to the moon, you said to me once. We sat on the roof, four green bottles already emptied into your stomach. We have been to the moon, you said, but I can't get inside your head. Thank God, I thought, but did not say. I should have just said it. You would have understood what terrible jangling it would make one person in another's head. You're not missing out, I said, and you did not laugh. Of course I am, you said instead. I wanted to kiss you you who will not sing but listen like death comes at each song's end, every note your last chance to understand the world. Of course I am, you said, and I wanted to push you off the roof. Why didn't you just laugh? Why do you insist, nose inches from the paper even now, reading of subtones, the Lydian mode? Why do you insist that from each note the whole world can be unspooled? There is nothing special about the inside of my head. A fabric stall, bolts of blue cloth for $2 a yard, flimsy imitation of the sea. Within your throat, the swallowed pearl burns. In the name of music, someone must refrain. And the next piece is called um, Ashling at the Ballard Locks um, and it's after a piece by Arya Aber. I am once again in love with a woman who does not love me back, but it's all good. This time her skin is missed, only real as sight. She's of the bay I watch, Northwest Seattle, vision or ghost, I cannot tell. Doesn't matter. I love the lilt of her wrists. The blade of her breath twists in me like grief. The scrape of her voice irrevocable as she rises from a bay that used to be salt water, from a lake once eight feet taller. One million people come to the locks every year. I am one such voyeur. It is a peculiar machine, the water level controlled by concrete doors that open and shut, boats passed along, the sea risen and dropped. Lake Union crouches to Puget Sound, and so she bends to sorrow. The locks fill, and she rises with the next passerby. She's a changeable woman. Rowdy as guilt, tender as a gun on fired, angry as a wound. Wound. This land is coastal Salish, Duwamish. There's blood in the water, the concrete, the wood, water passed from sound to lake, hand to hand, one strip sent, then another. Rivers were wrenched from the earth for this. Salmon tried to flee. Let me not in my love for the water turn from all blood. Let me not pump meaning cruel as gasoline. She that I love is a vision. She sings in a language I do not know, perhaps an elegy or an ode, a work song, a song of war. It is not mine to say, it is not mine to question, to beg forgiveness, to look away. Hi, my name is Ananya, and today I'll be reading two poems. The first is called Easy Life or the Sun. Easy Life or the Sun. Sundays we pretended our world was bathed in light. And if I returned home, everyone would be there. 
my sweet and now resurrected dad would welcome me. My friends would kiss me as if things had been this way all along. We lived our lives in parallel, meeting at the centers. We saw no endings, only medals, the infinite continuity of loving, the bursting flesh of tulips every spring without the winter that took their colors. The world was tongued iridescent platinum. Every element and ornament returned to history. It was easy for once to write a poem. I did not have to wrangle with the creature of desire tucked into my uneasy corners. I did not have to see myself in order to comprehend the inner meaning of my hidden words. Unfortunately, truthfully, actually, I wake up in the cool breeze called morning. Poetry greets me and the width of unsaid words hang between us, terse like fresh silk. You see, it is hard to make beauty out of words, those unliving things, when grief is austere and unspeaking, a tired spirit moving through me. When it commands me, there is an openness where my body should be. I look for myself, but all I see is a series of connected lines, a figure, a girl, Still, I convince myself to see light through the window, urge myself to place words on the page though they languish. Still, my roommate sleeps well into the afternoon and the kittens I've learned to call my own wrestle, breaking all the mortal cups I've collected over the years. I keep going for tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. I wait for the lines I write to converge. Things must end to begin and true, though painful it may be. I never learned the power of loving until it was gone, taken from my arms in a flurry. Yes, I never felt more truly the force of the sun's light, save for the first day of spring when it found me and kiss my cheeks. Go on, it said. And so I did. I went on. The other poem I'll be reading today is called Roses, um, and it is in honor of my grandfather who passed away quite recently. His name was Ramayar Krishnamurthy. So Roses after Ramayar. At the beginning of growing season, you can see a loved one's spirit trembling in tilted blades of grass or resting in the curve of a crescent moon. It is said that a spirit does not leave or die, merely changes form. So it might be said that a spirit is the difference of death and the continuity of endless life joined on the slim lips of a knife's edge. I considered her my grandfather might be and pictured him his spirit an inflexible golden creature, sprouting at daybreak and lamenting at dusk, hovering in the thorns of a nascent rose bush. It moves through me, the way the memory of a kiss impresses itself upon the body. Winter was ending when he passed. In those damp and raw days, I saw my own grief multiplied in the faces of those he loved and in the gestures of those I loved in turn. Still we preached, still I prayed. I wanted life to go on. My friend told me it was a common calamity, but her fingers trembled as she said her late grandmother's name. Still, her eyes watered, her face flushed. After languishing for hours with her, I realized I did not wish to spare these people agony. No, I wanted to be with them, my suffering people, so I could hold grief close, knowing 
that when the spirit moved through us once more, we would recognize the voices of grandparents, parents, pets, lost elders, and loved ones. We would hear them and smile. I needed to feel the despair of loss in order to recognize life's energy. Only then could I learn that come summer, the roses would arrive again. I would see my grandfather's spirit in their red and pink colors and recall the special beauty of a new bloom. I'm Lucy Silva, and the first poem I'm going to read is called Rain. Rain. In my dream, it is fall, and my mother and I stand on the edge of a field at sunset. Fall or early winter, we wear coats. My mother wears a knit hat too, and looks not quite like I remember. Behind us, the woods smell of mulch and dead animals. My mother laughs at everything I say. My mother is dead, possibly. Linnets call in the branches. The sky glows red as the inside of an eyelid. Wind, a tinge of sulfur, an anxiousness. What am I forgetting? The grass, an assault of blades. It is almost taller than we are. It is almost frightening. My mother strokes my hair and humming a little, begins to braid it. You're good, Lucy girl, she keeps saying. My mother, running her hands over the weave of the braid. You're good. And now water pummels the field, fast and silent. Water from the sky, it just falls. And how can it be that I have always just accepted this? And the second poem is called Novgorod. Novgorod. Outside the town Kremlin, a man sits selling his oil paintings, maybe a hundred bright as paperbacks spread in crooked lines on the grass. I want to stop and look, but I'm afraid. I rehearse the phrases in my head, can't buy anything, very beautiful. Past the boots of trinkets, the cathedral's cupolas blaze. The iron tongues swing in the belfries. Sergei Rachmaninoff was born in this old Gorod, though he spent the famous part of his life a homely refugee in New York City. For years, he longed to hear these bells again, the bells of St. Sophia's Cathedral in Novgorod. Though he never did, his music is full of pangs, the ghostliest bells. In the 11th century, before the peasants carried St. Vladimir's icon to Moscow from Constantinople, Novgorod was the seat of Muscovy. Wooden streets, stilted houses along the river basin. It was, as Tolstoy wrote later of Moscow, a wooden city destined to burn, which it did, as did Rachmaninoff's house, though that was a different fire in a later century. In the coach bus out of town, we passed a laundromat with misspelled English in the window. Then the grasslands again, miles and miles of windswept cattails. Loneliness is different in a foreign place. I imagine Rachmaninoff knew that well. Hello, my name is Eliana Swordlow and I am a senior in Pearson College. I'm very grateful to have worked on these poems under the mentorship of my professor, Louise Glick. This first poem is based on an experience I had studying abroad in the Himalayan country of Bhutan, where I live next to a river called the Parochu. Parochu. In Bhutan, I find faces in the rocky side of the mountain just across the river. A Himalayan black bear, you sit on the ledge I imagine to be my uncle's eyebrows. We study what's in the valley between us. Loose cows, skinny horses, and a couple under a willow tree. I don't see you move. I am distracted by the young monks in pink rain boots crossing the road. I wonder where in the Himalayas I would find you if I were to return. 
I want to know who in my family you've met as you've walked over their faces. In these mountains, that I regret for a moment felt like mine. I wrote this next poem last semester during these very strange and difficult times when we have a lot of time with ourselves. Dresser. I am sitting in bed eating chicken noodle soup when I see myself in the mirror above my dresser. It is a beautiful dresser. My face is skinnier, longer. My hair is curlier. I found some new shampoo. This old pajama shirt will become a rag soon. It will wipe off the grease on the stove, later the mud on the tile, finally the cat piss on the floor before it's thrown out for good. The dishwasher drain is broken. The plates are piling up in the sink. The steel wool, no longer coarse, is filled with pieces of old pasta. I'm the thief. I've been taking flowers from the community garden. I pull my scissors out of my bag when no one is looking. Who cares if a few flowers are missing? Who could tell? My face has more freckles and they aren't the pretty kind dusted evenly over one's face. I haven't worn my sunscreen. Didn't your mother warn you? My reflection asks without pause or pity. Thank you. Hi, my name is Irene Vasquez and I'll be reading two poems today. The first is called, I will love. I will love possible things, monarchs in real life, the contented sweetness of Confederate jasmine, despite its name, grape tomatoes blistered open in the pan, a recipe fulfilled. And yes, the familiar smoke of tequila, the coconut cake that's a smidge too dry, too much coffee, each cup a landmark for days that stopped passing. And yes, a weak God, a benevolent companion in all this waiting, faith in the possible to rearrange me. Every mile I coax from my fallible knees. The second poem is called The Black Shoals. Swallow me whole, O beast of the Southern radar, patron of the disaster zone of the unsurvivable storm surge, O surveiller of our anxieties of a drowning foretold. Here we are in another August of hot darkness, another storm ravaging the Black Shoals, and I am told the map isn't even accurate anymore. The coastline has eroded so much that Louisiana is no longer a boot shape. Our shore is more salt water than homestead, and I click through headlines on Twitter like it's all new. My lungs were declared a disaster zone long ago. My people have wandered and were lost refugees in their own country, their homes named uninhabitable long before the storm even hit. I've lived 15 years flinching at the slightest crack of thunder, but it is August. Three months into a national uprising, 400 plus years into a people's apocalypse, 20 days after a man was shot in the back seven times, Wisconsin, and I'm tired of telling people that these are natural disasters. Three years ago, when the last storm hit, I might have told you that every 500 years, someone must bear the sins of a people. But in the years since my hands first began to shake, I've learned who and what and where is responsible. And as the storm spins in the radar, I watch colonization unfold in real time. Man-made climate change spins whiteness into stacks of white cumulonimbus. As the eye of the storm intensifies with each degree stacked in the gulf, each tick moves upward on the stock exchange. Tell me someone didn't dream up this deluge, this clearing of land, uninhabitable, contaminated. Tell me who has the right to remain. Tell me without flinching that my life matters. Truth be told, the storm isn't even the half of it. Ain't nothing new about our lands declared, uninhabitable, cleared for industrial use, for flume and flare, for fire and brimstone. This place, the only one where we were allowed to reside, refineries, petrochemical infestations have taken hold in our homelands, and in the days before natural disaster, they unleash one man-made all on their own. Here, our bodies marked in yellow tape, uninhabitable, flooding the lungs of our communities with the smoke from their stacks. Oh. Our Lady of Perpetual Fever Dreams, our asphalt sovereign, mother of ozone action days and asthmatic breath. 
Behold how the men have partitioned our city, sliced and diced until all that is left is to worry and wait. We were never meant to survive. And ain't that some shit? Ain't that something holy and all this mud bound? Ain't that some black life? For still, I sit here loving you, blessed city of perpetual rain cloud. We who have kept on keeping on pressing toward the mark. We brought here to these black shoals long before the storms came. We who will keep the land long after our captors are gone. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Sophia Zhao, and today I will be reading two poems. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Cynthia Zarin for her mentorship and guidance. Lessons on Fish. It was not yet mid-morning when you reeled in your first catch of the day, but already a thin layer of mucus had congealed over the eyes. I lingered by the edge of the lake, alone before the surly drones and yellow eyes of frogs peeping out from beneath lily pads. Even then, I understood I did not need to follow you into the kitchen to see the performance unfold. You, submerging the carp in cold water, not for the slaughter, which had already been done back there among the water lilies, but to work loose the mucus before wedging the blade of your knife beneath the scales. Though we share it all the same, my blood was never cold enough for this manner of carnage. And I busied myself instead with catching frogs, coaxing them into old plastic bottles filled halfway with lake water and teeming other life. These I released before you called me in for lunch. Lunch was for learning the names of fish, but I am not so sure about words anymore. Nowadays, the ones that make it to your tongue emerge not quite right, but most gets caught in your throat like a fishbone, though it's been years since you set off at dawn to reel in a glass-eyed carp. Snow globe in a New York City souvenir shop. Here, there is always light, though no moon. A mantle of freshly fallen snow, illuminating the sloped eaves of a wooden house nestled among a line of evergreens. Here there is quiet, the kind that leaves room for a duet with the wind, one whistling back to the other like sandpipers in the night. This is odd to say that the quiet is not so absolute that we might hear something so delicate as a pin drop. Here, then, is a question or two for us to ponder. Why must we imagine silence in terms of pins? How many must roll off the edge of a nightstand, displaced by an errant sweep of the hand as one fumbles for the lamp, for us to wrap our heads around the absence of sound, that the words between one and another have expired, the man whistling out an open window, the melody of some song whose name eludes him, and his wife with the covers raised to her chin, dreaming still of flowers needling the permafrost, creeping through the open windows of their house. Thank you.